So now that we're getting into the world of dysrhythmias, I bet that you just can't get enough. So we've learned what's normal. Now we need to learn what's abnormal. So um, one of the first things that, um, you know, we're going to start with is talking about when there's problems with the top of your heart. Remember, the top of your heart is your atrium. So we're going to talk about um, abnormal heart rhythms that start from the top of your heart. So what happens when there's a problem with the top of your heart? So when you think the top of our, your heart, you have to think back to that horrible um, PowerPoint presentation I had that was really confusing about um, getting started with EKG. And so um, when you're thinking um, back to that PowerPoint, remember I said, if, you, um, if you're looking at this, each of these you know, little scribbles on these pieces of paper is representing a different part of the cycle of your heart pumping. And so uh, if you remember back to that, I said that your P wave was a sign of your atria or the top of your heart contracting. So in other words, if I'm having a problem with the top of my heart, think there's a problem with my P wave. So that's what the first thing I'm gonna look at. So one of the things I brought up in that first PowerPoint is you wanna start looking at, is everything that's supposed to be there present? Um, you know, and, um, you know, if it is like, is it how it's supposed to be? And so if I'm having a problem with the top of my heart or an atrial problem, there's going to be something off with my P wave. My QRS will be normal and skinny. Remember, we talked about that QRS being skinny in that other PowerPoint. In other words, you know, it's going to be narrow. That's how the QRS is supposed to be. It's not supposed to take a long time for the bottom of the heart to contract. And so if I'm having a problem with the top of my heart, the QRS or the skinny thing, it's going to be normal because I'm not having a problem in my ventricles. I'm having a problem in my atrium, which is the P wave. So I'm going to look for the P wave. It may be missing. It may be irregular. It may be upside down or it could be hidden. And so these are some of the things I'm going to look for for different top of the heart problems. So the most common rhythm that you're ever going to see, or I should say abnormal rhythm that you're ever going to see is what's called atrial fibrillation. And what happens with atrial fibrillation is effectively the heart is not contracting, it's fibrillating. So instead of like there being like a very nice contraction where it's spitting blood out, it's literally kind of like, you know, it's kind of, it's letting go of some blood. Obviously there's some, you know, output happening, um, but it's not very effective. It's kind of literally randomly kind of fibrillating. There's not a good like firm squeeze. It's just kind of like a random, you know, um, you know, little fibrillation or can, um, it's, I don't even want to call it a contraction because it's not even a full contraction. Um, but yeah, think of this as a really big problem because if my, the top of my heart is just fibrillating and its job is to give a firm squeeze and push blood out, um, it's not going to move blood forward forward well, which means I'm going to have decreased cardiac output. And remember, everything in cardiac that we talk about comes down to cardiac output. It's all about the fact that if I am not um, pumping or moving blood forward, if I'm not contracting well, I can't move blood forward. And if I'm not moving blood forward, I'm also not moving oxygen forward. And if I'm not moving oxygen forward, my tissues cannot get the oxygen that they need in order to function the way that they need to. So at the end of the day, the big problem in atrial fibrillation is I am not getting blood flow forward or oxygen forward in order to supply my tissues. The other problem is if I'm just kind of fibrillating um, randomly, I also can have pooling of blood. So in other words, like if it's not moving forward, it's just sitting there. And anytime you hear blood pooling, always think about blood clots. If my blood is pooling anywhere, that's not a good thing. I'm going to be high risk for blood clots. So the two big things we worry about with atrial fibrillation is one, decrease cardiac output, and two, these patients are high risk for blood clots. So the assessments that I'm going to do is I want to check to see how they're tolerating it. And this is something that you're going to kind of hear as a common thing for all dysrhythmias. How is the patient doing with this rhythm? What is their blood pressure? Are they able to talk to me? What's their mental status? How are they oxygenating? I'm going to check their oxygen levels, like um, get one of those probes for their fingers and check what their SpO2 is. How well are their tissues getting perfused? Because again, I'm worried about cardiac output. If they're not able to respond to me, talk to me and things like that, that's probably because they're not getting good cardiac output to their brain. If their blood pressure is low, that's because they're not pushing blood forward because their top of their heart is not contracting. And if their oxygen levels are low, it's because because they're not moving blood forward, so they're not moving oxygen forward, so their tissues can't get the oxygenation it needs. 
So even if they feel okay, keep in mind, um, and even if their assessment's okay, even if their blood pressure's normal, they're like, I'm fine. Why are you so freaked out? Even if their oxygen level's at 100%, we still have to treat this rhythm. Um, we have to prevent complications from it. Because like I said, the other issue is blood pools. So we're gonna be worried about blood clots. Um, something that I think really helps students because a lot of times you like let's look at this rhythm here if you look at this it, a lot of times students are like oh I see p waves do you see a definitive p wave can you look at something um, and say that is a hundred percent a p wave and most students are like well kind of you know um, but you like there's nothing that I can firmly say looks like what it's supposed to go back and look at what normal sinus rhythm looks like and look at how different this is um, if you can't, if you're not sure, if you can't succinctly say there's the P wave right before the QRS, the way that it's supposed to be, it is not a P wave. Um, you want it to be so bad. So, um, you know, but it's not. The other thing that really stands out about atrial fibrillation or makes it different, it's regularly irregular. So if you watch that first miserable video that I made, um, then, you know, you're going to remember back to when I talked about a normal R to R interval. Um, and so that's saying the normal space between, um, or the, the uh, not the normal space, but the space between each heartbeat should have the same distance between. It should be, you know, the same distance as said. It should be at a regular rhythm. Um, but if you look at this, look at this heart rhythm, it's kind of like, You know, see, it's, it's going like, it's very like abnormal. So the one thing about atrial fibrillation is we call it regularly irregular. In other words, I can count on atrial fibrillation being irregular because <clears throat> I don't really, my, the top of my heart is not contracting, it's fibrillating. And so it's just going to be randomly contracting. So I never know what it's going to be doing. Like it's just randomly quivering, literally just quivering. Um, and because of that, um, it's unpredictable, um, you know, with the space that's going to be between each beat, because there's going to be a a lot of quivering in between the bottom of the heart contracting. So um, uh, we caught, uh, that's another way that you can kind of look at it is that it's going to be one of the only rhythms that regularly you can count on it on being irregular. In other words, the space between each of the pointy things is going to be different usually each time. So then what's atrial flutter? So atrial flutter is, um, you know, the exact same problem as AFib. You know, all of everything I just mentioned, everything applies. The only thing that's different is that it has a different looking wave. So you can see here at the top, this is atrial fibrillation, again, regularly irregular. But here at the bottom, this is atrial flutter. So they have what call, what are called sawtooths. And what that means is it kind of looks more, it's more um, uniform and it looks prettier, of course. I mean, like some people would sit there and be like, oh, those are P waves, but look how many of them there is. There's only supposed to be one P wave before that QRS, but look at how many there is here. There's something not right here, but it's literally like sawtooth, kind of like shark's teeth um, is what they say, the sawtooth pattern. Um, and this is what atrial flutter is. We're going to treat it the same. It's the same issues, cardiac output, blood pooling, the only difference is just in the look of the waves. And sometimes it's a little bit more regular, you know, like, you know, it's a little bit more predictable, but as a whole, same problems. My blood pressure can be low. I can have trouble oxygenating. I can be having poor cardiac output. So I'm going to treat it the same. And how do we treat these rhythms? My goal in atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter is to convert these, this rhythm. Um, I'm gonna give them medications like amiodarone, calcium channel blocks or blockers, digoxin. If those medications don't work, and I always wanna start with the least invasive measures first, then I'm gonna probably have to um, you know, go to cardioversion, which we'll talk about later. Um, but effectively that's where um, I shock the patient, um, you know, uh, like with, um, while they still have a pulse to try to get them back into a normal rhythm. If I cannot convert them, I at least wanna slow them down. So that's where I can use beta blockers. Beta blockers will not get me back to a normal rhythm, but they will slow me down. Because remember we talked about, you know, I don't want my heart rate going too fast. And I don't want it going too slow. And with atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, my heart rate can get up into the 180s or 200s. It can get really crazy. Because here's the thing, the bottom of your heart, you know, is expecting to be in sync with the top of your heart. And if the top of your heart's just kind of randomly fibrillating, the bottom of your heart's like, well, where's my blood? What's going on here? So what does it do? It tries to, you know, pump faster. And it also is trying to get in sync with the top of your heart. And it really can't because the top of your heart's just kind of randomly constantly fibrillating or quivering. Um, and so the bottom of your heart can start to go crazy. And so you can have a really, really, really quick or fast rate. So we want to 
we want to, if nothing else, slow this down. But at the end of the day, we want to convert it because as long as my the top of my heart's fibrillating, I'm going to be really high risk for blood clots and, and be at really high risk for complications. Um, so again, I'm going to use medications like amiodarone or calcium channel blockers or digoxin. And all three of these, they can convert me and they slow me down. So they help to decrease that rate, but they also can change me from atrial fibrillation back to normal sinus rhythm. They don't always, but they have the possibility to. So um, again, convert is my preference, but if I can't convert, I at least want to slow it down. I'm also going to treat the symptoms. If the patient's blood pressure is low or they're really not tolerating it, I'm going to give them fluids um, as ordered. And then if they're um, you know, short of breath or not breathing well, then I'm going to give them oxygen, um, of course, to support them um, until we can get them back to a normal rhythm or at least decrease their rate. And then I'm going to prevent complications. A lot of these patients are going to be on lifelong anticoagulant therapy. Um, so once you have atrial fibrillation, you're really high risk, of course, for having it again or going in and out of it. And so um, these patients, you know, to decrease their risk of stroke and other problems, because remember, blood pools, clots form. And then what is, where's your heart go? It goes out to the rest of your body. So if I'm forming clots in my heart, it's going to spew out to the rest of my body. Very, very dangerous. So these patients are going to be usually on lifelong anticoagulation. So the next rhythm I'm going to talk about is what's called SVT or PSVT. And this is supraventricular tachycardia. And I want to clarify, this is not super, it's supra. And supra means above, because this one always confuses people because it says super ventricular tachycardia. So see people hear ventricular and they're like, wait a second. I thought we were talking about atrial problems or top of the heart problems. This is a top of the heart problem because supra means above. So if this rhythm is called supraventricular, what's above the ventricles? Huh? The atria, the top of the heart. So that's why it's called supraventric uh, ventricular because it's this is literally if you had to spell this out this the name of this rhythm is above the ventricle tachycardia and so it's a top of the heart problem and what qualifies this remember in that first horrible powerpoint where I'm um, you know confused the heck out of most of you guys um, you know where I talk about um, the dist uh, the um, the QRS being skinny or fat so this is one of the times that I need to look at my QRS it's one of those things I can look at and like look at this rhythm um, when I'm looking at this I don't I, there's like a, a you know like some sort of um, you know hill here but I don't know if it's the uh, the P wave or the T wave um, and then I have a really skinny and fast rhythm going on. And so my QRS is skinny or narrow and that's normal. So I, since that QRS is skinny or normal, I don't have a bottom of the heart problem. I have a top of the heart problem. So the way that I always remember this rhythm is it's fast and skinny. Um, we can't see P waves. They are there, but you can't see them. What you see here in this rhythm are T waves. And you know that because they're coming right off of our QRS there. Um, the heart is beating super fast in SVT or PSVT. The rate is usually greater than 150 and there's no time for filling again. So when we talked about in my other video about normal rhythms about um, sinus tachycardia, I was talking about how the problem is, is that there's no time for filling so that therefore there's no good cardiac output. Um, and that's what's going to be the problem at the end of the day. Even if a patient, like I've walked in on patients with a heart rate of 180 in this rhythm and they're eating a peanut butter sandwich and they're like, what's the problem? Why are you so upset? And they get really mad when I tell them to put down their peanut butter sandwich because they got a you know a really crazy rhythm going on. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, like I kind of have here, even if this patient says they feel okay, I still got to do something about this. I can't let someone, I, my heart cannot withstand a heart rate of 150 to 180 or 200 for a long period of time. So at the end of the day, um, if a patient has this really, really fast rhythm, we need to do something about it because uh, more than likely they're going to be showing signs and symptoms of poor cardiac output. Their blood pressure may be low because again, they're not getting blood out because there's no time to fill. If I don't have time to fill up with blood, I can't pump anything out. I have to have that filling time or that rest period to fill up just like a toilet. I have to have time to refill so I can push blood out to the rest of the body or flush the toilet again. Um, you know, as I like my toilet analogies. Um, and so, um, you know, the other thing I'm going to check their neurological status, are they getting blood flow or perfusion to their brain? Um, and then I also want to check their oxygenation. What's their SpO2 or their, uh, their um, you check their finger probe and see how well they're getting oxygenation. And like I said, as a whole, 
even if they're feeling okay, and even if their assessment's okay, we still need to treat it. So what are we gonna do for this? Um, their goals for this rhythm are going to be to convert it or again, slow it down. Um, and you know, uh, most of the time we're going to convert this rhythm. Um, we always, again, want to start with the least invasive first. We're going to start with a vagal maneuver if they're stable. Now, if this patient is incredibly hypotensive, they are, um, you know, really not tolerating it. So their oxygen levels low. Um, they're confused, lethargic, really struggling. I'm not going to sit there and tell them to do a vagal maneuver because they need something else quicker first. But if I can do a vagal maneuver, if they're sitting there like that patient, I've had multiple patients that's sitting there eating a peanut butter sandwich and saying, why are you getting so upset, lady? Um, so what I'm going to tell them to do first, if they're tolerating it, their blood pressure is okay, they're doing all right. I'm going to have them do a vagal maneuver, which is where um, effectively you're bearing down. So think of that straining. You think of like a person on a toilet straining to have a bowel movement. That's what I'm going to try to do. It's trying to create a pressure that's going to convert the rhythm. And believe it or not, this works. And if you're working with a patient that's maybe, you know, Spanish speaking or doesn't really quite get it. Um, a lot of times what you can have them do is blow into a straw and a cup of water. And that's another way that they can do the same maneuver, but effectively you want them to, uh, you know, bear down and really create a pressure within themselves to try to convert that rhythm. If that doesn't work, then we're going to go to medications like adenosine. Um, and, um, you know, uh, effectively what this does is think of, you know, like um, with all the technology issues we've had since having to, you know, go to online education, um, this is effectively um, like a reset switch. So like, it's when like you guys tell me like, hey, my test, um, you know, froze or whatever. What do I tell you? I tell you, turn it off and turn it back on. And that's effectively what a denison is, is like it, it literally like this is a, an EKG strip of someone getting a denison. And um, effectively, um, what happens is they're in this really, really fast rhythm. We give the adenosine, and this is the only medication you're ever going to do this with, um, but you're going to push it really fast. You literally slam it into the patient, slam in a flush, and what it does is it forces the heart to stop. So that when the patient gets this medication, you actually are officially putting them, they usually go flat line. And then you pray to God or whatever you believe in, you uh, pray to all the heavens that their heart's going to re restart um, because, uh, you know, in that moment you're sitting there and you're like, oh my God, please restart, please come on. Um, you know, and of course, this is not something you do by yourself. The doctor is going to be at the bedside with you. Um, and um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, going to be there to make sure that if it doesn't restart, that we start taking action and stuff like that. But effectively, this is a reset switch. So literally, I we give this medication, like you can see here, their heart stopped, it kind of went flat line, and then it started back up. And our goal or hope, or I should say our hope is, is, is that when their heart restarts, that it's going to start in a normal rhythm. So in other words, this stops the heart and it restarts it kind of like an on off switch trying to reset it to get it back to a normal rhythm. And then if not, we can, um, if that doesn't work, we can also try cardioversion. And cardioversion, of course, is, um, we'll talk about it more later, but it's effectively where we kind of shock, try to shock the patient back into a normal rhythm when they still have a pulse. And um, if, uh, you know, if during this time, while I'm trying to get them back to a normal rhythm, they're having symptoms like low blood pressure, I may give them fluids. And again, if they're short of breath, I may give them oxygen therapy. So if you're an adult, you do not need to pay attention to the rest of this presentation. All that this, this last um, rhythm is only for folks that are in complex. Um, but, you know, a junctional rhythm uh, effectively is uh, when I mentioned it in that really scary getting started with EKG PowerPoint, um, but effectively it's what happens when your body goes to its backup pacemaker. So like I kind of gave the example with all the snow craziness that we've had recently about that, like when people's electricity went out and then their um, backup generator kicks in, that's what a junctional rhythm is. And most of the time this happens because you've had like an overdose of digoxin or digoxin toxicity, I should say, <clears throat> excuse me, um, or uh, maybe too much of a beta blocker, things like that. Um, but, um, you know, most of the time, it's some sort of toxicity that's causing it, and we can easily, you know, reverse that. But effectively, what's happening is that SA node, or, you know, the normal pacemaker of your heart that beats 60 to 100 times a minute, it fails. And so what happens is your backup pacemaker starts to take over. So usually when patients are in a junctional rhythm, their heart rate's going to be slow, like 40 to 60 beats per minute. Because remember, if you remember that AV node, that next node, your backup node, that beats at 40 to 60 times per minute. 
Um, there are other types of junctional. There's accelerated junctional and junctional tachycardia. I'm not going to go too much into those. I'm really going to focus on the junctional escape because that's the one we worry about more because, again, that really slow rhythm um, can lead to a lot of problems with poor cardiac output. Again, too fast is a problem too, but, you know, as a whole, we worry most about that, um, you know, that really slow rhythm because, again, it's all going to come back to poor cardiac output. Um, and uh, you're going to notice that this rhythm is different because there's going to be no P waves or they're going to be missing or upside down, or you're going to notice that they're there, but there's a really, really small PR interval. So this is where you really need to know what your normal PR interval is. You also need to know what a P wave is supposed to look like um, and what it's supposed to be. And so you can see in this rhythm up here, there is no P waves there. It's just a flat line and that is a junctional rhythm. So like I mentioned, a lot of times we don't have to do anything with this rhythm. Like it either, it like as long, if they're stable, we can just monitor it. Um, if it's really slow and they're really symptomatic, we might have to give them some atropine to get that heart rate up. Um, but, um, you know, um, at the end of the day, if we it does have a known cause, we want to go and treat that cause, reverse that medication, get the, um, treat that digoxin toxicity, um, whatever it might be, and try to get to the root of the problem so that we can um, get the patient back to a normal rhythm. So those are your basic atrial rhythms that you'll need to know for adult and complex. I hope this was helpful and um, you know, go check out the ventricular um, you know, uh, rhythms as well because they're very um, heart stopping, I'll put it that way. Have a good night.